Good morning. I think we're going to start uh, shortly, so if you could take your places. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to the panel on using competition law to promote access to medicines and other health technologies. Thank you for joining. Closer. Is it better? Yeah, okay, thank you. It's green, I think. Yeah, thank you, Jen. Thank you for joining us this morning. It is my absolute pleasure to moderate this panel on the use of competition law to promote access to medicines and other health technologies. I'm, of course, highly intimidated by my panelists and that have graciously um, agreed to join um, the 
panel, but also for the audience um, that has joined us. There is so much knowledge in this room on the use of competition law. The only advantage to me is that I lost my glasses, so I don't see you. Um, uh, I feel much better. Uh, so once uh, we discuss this issue, because this is going to be a discussion, I would love your help uh, uh, on identifying yourself and um, who are you speaking from or from or from which perspective. Um, the format that we are proposing for this panel is a dialogue and a discussion, given the knowledge in this panel as well as in the audience. There's going to be a first section that is going to be short uh, presentations by um, my distinguished panelists. It's going to be less than an hour, and I'm going to be brutal on time management, even if I admire and love everybody of them. Um, then we're going to open up for a whole hour of discussion among the panelists and among the audience. Um, so we're ready uh, because uh, we want your active participation in this, in this discussion. Before we start, let me briefly introduce UNDP, the organization where I work, and share some context on our access to medicines and innovation um, for medicines and other health technologies. My name is Judith Rios, and I work for the health and development team of the UNDP Bureau for Policy and Program Support in New York. For the ones not familiar with the organization, UNDP stands for the United Nations Development Program. We are an international development agency and a subsidiary of the United Nations. UNDP works in more than 170 countries around the world, and our mandate is to support governments and development partners in uh, the efforts to eradicate poverty, reduce inequalities, and uh, uh, achieve uh, sustainable development goals and targets as part of Agenda 2030. UNDP work on access to medicines has its origins more than 10 years ago, when working with many uh, in this room, we started supporting governments and others in efforts to increase access to medicines um, for the HIV AIDS uh, epidemic. In 2014, UNDP published a guidebook for low and middle income countries on using competition law to promote access to health technologies. You have the publication in that table, as well as a short issue brief um, summarizing that publication. It's also available in our website. I want to recognize and thank the main authors of that publication, Professor Frederick Abbott, Sean Flink, Professor Carlos Correa, Jonathan Berger, and Natasha Nyak, and my colleague Cecilio, that is leading UNDP work program on competition law from UNDP Bangkok. So why is UNDP interested in competition law? UNDP believes that one of the most effective tools to support governments in the achievement of Agenda 2030 is the creation of enabling legal and policy environments. The AIDS response is proof that access to affordable and effective medicines can halt and reverse an epidemic, contribute to increase in life expectancies and healthier communities and development overall. Increase innovation and ensuring the widest availability of medicines, diagnostics and vaccines is essential for the achievement of Agenda 2030 and all its goals and targets, including universal health coverage. This week, in New York, governments have agreed to scale up the response for tuberculosis as well as for non-communicable diseases, including promoting innovation and access to health technologies. And we're preparing in 2019 for another UN high-level meeting, this time on universal health coverage. So this issue should be at the core of the UN um, development work as well as the UN development mandate. Many of the tools that we use for the AIDS response are still useful and important. Many are going to be and are being discussed in this, um, in this important forum. But technological as well as economic, policy, and legal developments are creating an imperative to open the toolbox to look at different alternative or complementary strategies to promote competition. We're dealing with monopolistic strategies that limit the creation and dissemination of knowledge, public goods, and the public <coughs> interest, and we need to use all the tools available to deal with that. The UNDP goal, by publishing this guidebook and organizing this panel, is to increase understanding, discussion, and a strategic use of all the tools in the toolbox, including competition law, to achieve Agenda 2030. So enough of introductions. I hope that gives you enough context of who we are and what we are organizing this panel. With further delay, let me introduce my distinguished and unloved panelists and thank them again for agreeing uh, to be part of this discussion. Um, they have very impressive bios and I have 
summarize them to a level uh, unacceptable. So I apologize to them and to you for the short introductions that I'm going to make to them. So let me start from our first uh, panelist, Professor and Dr. Carlos Correa. Dr. Carlos Correa is the Executive Director of the South Center, an intergovernmental organization of developing countries. Dr. Correa is a lawyer, economist, and academic with ex expertise on international trade, intellectual property, health and technology transfer, and investment policy. Dr. Correa has authored many publications and advised governments and international organizations, including UNDP on a frequent base. Dr. Correa has been a member of several expert bodies, including the landmark WHO Commission on Intellectual Property, Innovation, and Public Health. Dr. Correa will present on international legal frameworks for the use of competition law as a tool to increase access to medicines and other health technologies. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Judith. Um, thank you for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here and to meet so many colleagues and friends. Um, I talk quite a lot, so I'm quite intimidated by this, uh, what you said about the brutal method that you will use to stop the speakers. But anyway, I'll try and do my best to be within the limits that you have uh, provided for. So the main question I will address is whether there is an international framework which limits the policy space for implementation of competition laws. So this is the main issue. In order to do this, I will just make a, a historical analysis how the competition law has been treated under different international regimes, what the outcomes have, have been. So the first important precedent to be mentioned is that uh, in the Havana Charter, Article 46, there was a provision that established an obligation for contracting parties to take appropriate measures to cooperate to prevent restrictive business practices that restrain competition. So the Havana Charter, which is, as you know, the predecessor of the GATT and then of the WTO agreement, did provide for a specific provision in the area of competition law as you know, the Havana Charter, however, was not adopted. And then when we look at the GATT uh, agreement, uh, this does not contain a similar provision. I will, I will make a reference in a minute about what the GATT contains in this respect. But then interestingly, after the GATT was adopted in 1947, the contracting parties raised some concerns about restrictive practices that affect uh, affected trade, in particular cartels, because cartels, export cartels, were not, were not subject to the control of antitrust or competition authorities. And therefore, a group of experts was established in the context of GATT in 1958. And it did produce a report uh, two years later, which was not very encouraging. Uh, the group of experts found that it was not practicable for contracting parties to undertake any form of control, nor to provide for any investigation in the context of GATT. So therefore, essentially, under GATT, there was no consensus whatsoever in order to develop disciplines in relation to competition. But then in 1976, um, at the conference that um, was held in order to establish the mandate for UNCTAD, there was a decision to work in the area of competition law. And this, matter, this mandate was pursued, and uh, a set of principles was developed and adopted in 1980. These are the set of multilateral, equitable, agreed principles and rules for the control of restrictive business practices, the so-called ANCTA principles on competition law. These principles are of voluntary basis. They were very much inspired by the antitrust law as applied at that time in the United States, because uh, Clearly, the antitrust law, as uh, some of the experts uh, present here know better than myself, has evolved significantly in the United States as well as in other jurisdictions. But then this set of principles reflected the situation the, of the U US law um, at that point. Um, uh, we, uh, these principles, for instance, uh, refer to price fixing, uh, other horizontal restraints, abuse of dominant position, discri discriminatory pricing, so on and so forth. Interestingly, uh, these, princ these principles were quite influential, um, in particular in order to uh, provide advice to a number of developing countries and adopt uh, legislation there of competition law. And developing countries endorsed quite uh, strongly these principles, and they promoted uh, shifting from a voluntary type of principles to a binding set of principles. So developing countries, 
perhaps uh, this, this, may be, this may be seen ironical today, just wanted to have binding provisions in relation to, uh, to this area, but they failed because developed countries were against the idea of uh, shifting into a model of binding principles. And therefore, this was attempted in 1995, in particular, at, uh, at one of the reviews. These principles are reviews every five years. So the uh, proposal by developing countries failed at that time and later. And therefore, these principles have remained quite influential, I would say, but non-binding. There was another important exercise where issues of competition law were dealt with. And this was the uh, initiative to adopt an international code of conduct on transfer of technology. This was also developed in UNCTAD. Um, there was a diplomatic conference that was convened in order to adopt this uh, international code of conduct. It was quite close uh, to adoption. And in fact, uh, there was a collapse at the last uh, dip diplomatic conference. And the collapse was precisely based uh, on the issue of how restrictive business practice should be defined. Uh, Work on this code was quite advanced, but there were major disagreement in between developed countries, the group B, and developing countries in relation to the definition of restrictive business practices. The group B, developed countries, wanted the definition based on competition law, and in particular on the rule of reason as in the United States, and the argument that should be an evaluation case by case and take into account the impact on the market, the relevant market. Developing countries were pursuing a broader concept of restrictive practices, taking into account development impact. So they wanted to have a list of practices, for instance, restrictions for a licensee to export in the context of transfer of technology, which was not necessarily covered under the definition in competition law, as, as it was in the case of the United States, but they wanted a broader development test in order to include these practices. And this was essentially the reason why this code was not adopted. This difference remained, and it was impossible then to uh, get an agreement on this, uh, on this international code of conduct. Then let me uh, come back to the, to the GATT uh, situation. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the provision that was in the Havana Charter was not reproduced in GATT. Uh, there are some elements, however, in the W2 system today that uh, address to some extent, the issue of competition. On the one hand, Article 17 of GATS uh, refers to uh, non-discriminatory treatment in purchases or sales by undertakings. So this is an indirect way of referring to competition law. In the GATS, the General Agreement on Trading Services, there is a more specific provision that provides for an obligation to enter into consultations uh, in relation to uh, practices that restrain competition in trade on services. This is a kind of positive committee, but it does recognize that restrictive business practices may affect trade in services. Also in the case of TRIMS, uh, the agreement that deals with uh, <coughs> trade-related investment measures, there is an interesting uh, reference to competition policy in Article 9. It is established that as part of the reviews of this agreement, there will be a consideration by the Council for Training Goods whether there was necessary or not to develop an investment and a competition policy. This never happened, however. There was no discussion. But the TRIMS agreement has many, many uh, um, relations to uh, competition, in particular because uh, some uh, performance requirements, for instance, local content, may be used in order to prevent some practices which uh, unf unfairly affect competition. This is a situation then in the context of, uh, of WTO as it is. As, as you know, probably, uh, the European Union was um, quite keen um, to introduce competition law as part of the disciplines in the WTO system. There was a proposal that was made in Singapore to discuss uh, the, first, the first conference of the WTO to discuss um, several new issues. And one of the new issues was competition. And the, and the proposal by the European Union was quite ambitious. Uh, the aim at uh, providing for disciplines in the context of WTO to control restrictive practices, to establish some methods of consultation, so on and so forth. And therefore, they were asking for clear commitments uh, in the context of WTO in the area of, of competition law. 
this, uh, this proposal by the European Union failed again. Um, all these, these new issues were, were, not, uh, were not actually uh, very, very welcomed by developing countries. Uh, one of them was also trade facilitation. In the end, there was something on trade facilitation. But competition law was one issue on, on, on which there was no further progress, despite, the, as I mentioned, the strong interest by, uh, the, European, by, by the European Union. And then one question that we, we may have is, why is this the case? Why is it that uh, there has been such a reluctance, in particular on the side of some developed countries, to introduce disciplines in the area of competition? As I mentioned, developing countries wanted some on the basis of the experience of the ANCA set of principles. The European Union was also uh, pursuing some type of disciplines, but this has not, uh, this has not succeeded. And perhaps one of the reasons for this is that um, in competition law there are strong differences in jurisdictions, in particular between the United States and, and Europe. There are differences in the way in which uh, abuse of dominant position is defined, the way some, uh, some particular restraints are considered. And perhaps one of, it has been said one of the reasons why there has been no progress in this field at international level is because the United States has not uh, was not willing to uh, subject its own legislation to international standards. They wanted to keep the freedom, the policy space, in order to apply their own, their own rules in this, in this respect. So there was no appetite for this, and therefore today we have a system, an international regime, which provides policy space, full policy space for developing competition, um, competition laws and disciplines. There is, however, in the TRIPS agreement, in Article 40, one quite peculiar provision that may be seen as limiting to some extent, as limited to some extent, okay, as, li as limited to some extent, the capacity of uh, members of WTO to provide for competition disciplines in relation only to contractual license. If you look at Article 40 of the TRIPS Agreement, which was initially proposed by developing countries, this was, this was not part of the initial proposals by the European Union, Japan, or the United States. It was initially proposed by developing countries, which in fact wanted to reflect to some extent the principles of the failed Code of Conduct Transfer of Technology in the TRIPS Agreement. In accordance to this provision, Members agree that some licensing practice or conditions pertaining to intellectual property rights which restrain competition may have adverse effects on trade and may impede the transfer and the dissemination of technology. So this is a general statement. There is no obligation in Article 40, Paragraph 1. Paragraph 2 of this article has also a very peculiar uh, drafting. It, it just says, nothing in this agreement shall prevent members from specifying in the legislation licensing practices or conditions that may, in particular cases, constitute an abuse of intellectual property rights having an adverse effect on competition in the relevant market. And then there is, there is interestingly, um, the, the following sentence, it does, make some, it does provide some examples of such practices, such as grand bank, grand bank provisions. But then there has been quite a lot of work on uh, trying to make an interpretation of this provision whether this uh, provision does empower member, members of WTO to implement uh, policies and laws to control restrictive practices in the area of licensing, or whether that this provision actually limits the scope for, that impl for implementation of such laws. Interestingly, if you look at this text, um, you, you, you will see that the competition standard that was applied in the United States, in particular, the rule of reason is reflected. This provision indicates that uh, there should be an assessment in particular cases, and there should be an assess assessment whether such practices constitute an abuse, which have an adverse effect on competition in the relevant market. So again here, developed countries prevail developing countries in their original text, they wanted to reflect this development test, meaning that some licensing provisions, licensing restrictions may be subject to disciplines even if these conditions are not met. For instance, one, 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 clear, one clear example is the case of licensing agreements which prevent the licensee from exports. 
This is a set of restriction because this will not allow a licensee to generate, for instance, scales of production. and will not allow the licensee to grow. And this is maybe cannot be captured under a provision of this kind. Therefore, this was the reason why developing countries were aiming at the broader concept. So this is just to say that in the, in the context of the WTO, there is in general broad scope for any WTO member to provide for disciplines in their of competition law. The only limitation may be found in Article 40, but just in relation to uh, contractual license and not beyond that. This means that any abuse, for instance, do abuse of dominant position is not subject to, uh, to the TRIPS agreement, nor to any other provision in WTO. Therefore, there is full freedom for uh, all WTO members to provide for their own disciplines, including, for instance, disciplines which not only will protect competitors, but which will protect consumers, including disciplines that, for instance, may be triggered in case of exorbitant prices, as it is the case un under some jurisdiction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Correa, for setting up the, the standards so high on time management and content. Um, the next presenter is Mrs. Umuyanga Rujese. Uh, Mrs. Umuyanga Rujese is the Deputy Director of Section 27, a leading South African public interest law center. Mrs. Rujese is a lawyer with many years of experience in the practice of law for social justice including currently focusing on access to healthcare services in the public and private sectors with high impact litigation and policy development. Mrs. Rujeje will be presenting on one of the most important examples of the use of competition law to increase access to medicines in a developing country, the 2003 Hazel, Dot, Tack and others HIV AIDS case, as well as an ongoing South African Competition Authority inquiries on the pricing of cancer treatment. Thank you. Thanks, Judith, um, and thanks for the opportunity to be on this esteemed panel. Um, I'm going to try and keep time. I can see you in the corner there. Um, so I, um, I'm not a competition lawyer. Um, I'm a human rights lawyer, so I, I will not get too technical. I'll leave that to the professors on this panel. Um, so, beginning with um, the constitutional framework, which as human rights lawyers we always begin with, um, looking at section 27 of the constitution, which um, guarantees the right of access to healthcare services, and also requires the state to take reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources to achieve the progressive realization of the right. Um, and the Competition Act itself as well provides for uh, the protection of consumers um, who should have access to goods and, goods and services um, and should be able to freely select um, any goods and services. Um, in terms of excessive pricing, Competition Act looks, um, provides at Section 8A um, the prohibition of excessive pricing. Um, and this does relate to the pricing of medicines. Um, so this, this provision considers whether a, a, a player in a market is a dominant player. Um, and so one would have to look first at uh, the market to see whether a particular player is dominant and then look at whether the pricing structure is excessive. Um, so one would have to look at whether the pricing is unreasonable, and whether the charging of that excessive price is detrimental to consumers. Um, so in the context of ARVs in the early 2000s, these were the provisions that um, the Section 27, previously the AIDS Law Project, began to look at. Um, and this was a time in which there were many deaths due to HIV and AIDS. Um, there was tremendous discrimination against people living with HIV, and there was also a great deal of violence against those people. Um, and at the time, of course, there were medicines available, but they were not accessible. 
Um, and the reason being the high cost of those drugs. So ARVs in the early 2000s in South Africa amounted to 1,000 rand a month. Um, and that was unaffordable then as it is now. Um, obviously, in the early 2000s, there were very few people who could afford those drugs, and those were the only people who could access life-saving medicines. And so Hazel Tower was in that very position. She had been divorced by her husband, who found out that she was HIV positive. Um, he went to court and, and got a divorce without her consent or knowledge, sold off the communal property, and she was left homeless and without any money at all. So she approached the AIDS Law Project and soon became one of the leading members of the Treatment Action Campaign. So the AIDS Law Project um, considered these provisions, and this was a very innovative way in which to conduct human rights law. Um, so Hazel Tao, together with um, healthcare workers, uh, one of the unions, COSATU was a leading union at the, at the time, began to, to do the research necessary. Um, and some, some of those people who were involved in that research are available in this room today, including Jamie. Um, and it was a great deal of highly technical information that had to be gathered, analyzed, and put into a form of a complaint to the Competition Commission. Um, so this, the, the drugs involved were produced by GlaxoSmithKline and Boringer Ingeheim, um, and the complaint was essentially that these companies engaged in excessive pricing of ARVs to the detriment of consumers. Um, and that was, of course, we argued, in contravention of, se of Section 8A of the Competition Act. Um, some of the evidence brought to the Competition Commission linked the lack of access directly to deaths um, and to ill health of people living in South Africa in huge numbers. Um, at this time, there were constantly funerals. Um, everyone was affected. And what was important about this intervention was that there was local solidarity amongst workers, amongst unions, amongst healthcare workers, community members, all of those who were affected, um, and international organizations working around the world, including in the US. Um, and so part of, part of the strategy was to force the pharmaceutical companies to have to explain to the public on this, on this uh, global stage as to why they were charging such excessive prices to people who were poor and could not afford it. Um, so the Competition Commission found that these companies were using their patent monopolies to deny licenses to other manufacturers and to keep their prices excessively high. Um, this finding would then have gone to the competition tribunal. Um, however, there was a settlement at that point. And I think partly because those companies wanted to avoid a public fight about these excessive prices and the models of pricing. Um, and partly those companies um, wanted to enter the rest of the African market. Um, and so they had an incentive to not air their dirty laundry in South Africa. So this case was settled in December 2003, um, and the licenses were then issued, and that, of course, then opened up access through the granting of licenses. Um, and I think one of the lessons that we learned is that solidarity is incredibly important and valuable as a strategic tool, um, but also that using individual drug-by-drug -drug cases um, in, a, in a country or in countries where there are huge public health disease burdens um, is somewhat unsustainable for civil society. Um, and that we have to use some of the other tools available in competition law to address the systemic problems. So I'll talk then about one, of the, one such tool. Um, as you know, the Fix the Patent Laws campaign, which includes Section 27, MSF, um, Cancer Alliance, the Treatment Action Campaign, and many other patient advocacy organizations have been talking about the high price of cancer medicines. Um, we've been doing research and writing reports 
um, writing letters to the Minister of Health about high prices of Herceptin, the fact that there was no access to Herceptin um, and other cancer drugs in the public sector due to the high prices. And so what we didn't anticipate was that the Competition, competition Commission was paying attention to all of our noise making um, in the public and in the media and quite unexpectedly uh, launched uh, an investigation. On the 13th of June, 2000, uh, 2017, the Competition Commission announced an investigation into Roche, Pfizer, and Aspen. And they said this, civil society organizations such as the Cancer Alliance and Section 27 have raised concerns that the respondent charges exorbitant and excessive prices for breast cancer medicines in South Africa. These organizations attribute high, high breast cancer prices to, amongst other things, abuse of patent laws. So we'd been heard. We didn't specifically ask for an inquiry or an investigation, but this is now ongoing. What we then had to do was educate the commission on the entire medicine structure, on pharmaceutical companies, how they operate, how they operate globally, tiered pricing, um, the fact that they, um, they are charging very high prices around the world, doing the research to look at global pricing um, and provide that research to the commission so that it, it is able to do its work. Um, lastly, um, we also fought for another provision to be implemented in the Competition uh, Act, and that was the, the market inquiry provisions. This, is, this provides an incredible opportunity to look into an entire sector within the economy. Um, the market inquiry provisions came into force because of our lobbying, um, and also we, we lobbied for specifically an inquiry into private healthcare services in South Africa, which also are high, very high cost um, in the country. So we were involved in the terms of reference. We ensured that the right to health was foremost in the, in the terms of reference. And we now have a provisional report published in July this year, um, which says that there is a lack of competition in the private healthcare sector, costs are increasing, and they provide some very important recommendations to fix those things. Thank you. Mr. Jamie Love. Mr. Love is the Director of Knowledge Ecology International, a leading non-governmental organization working on the production, management, and access of knowledge public goods. In economic finance, and his contributions to the public interest are too numerous to cite. Uh, Mr. Love is was his presentation on his experiences and the experiences of his organization on the use of competition law to increase access to innovation and access to medicines in developing countries from a practitioner's perspective. Thank you. Okay, uh, can you hear me okay? Um, well, uh, thank, th thank you, Judith, for including me in this panel. And um, um, I, I, I thought I'd, I'd start out by saying that the first competition case I ever worked on was uh, in Alaska, and, and it involved mobile homes and rent control. Uh, there was a um, rent controls during a, a big uh, uh, boom in employment f from building a pipeline. So you couldn't charge very much for, for the, the, the space that you would put a mobile home on. But the persons that controlled mobile home spaces would enter into agreements, so you'd, you'd have to buy a trailer from a particular vendor in order to rent the space. So the, in theory, the, you know, the space was cheap, but the trailers were really expensive. And that was the first antitrust case ever brought under the state of Alaska uh, antitrust case. And that was a tie-in case. And that's one of the things that got me interested, I think, uh, from a completely different field, actually. Um, the next case I work on that, that uh, was successful um, was an investigation of West Publishing, which publishes legal opinions. And before, this, uh, before the courts ruled that the citation system for West Publishing was in the public domain, um, uh, there was assertions of copyright. And we obtained a compulsory license on the um, 
the citation system uh, as a condition of a merger uh, between West Publishing and Thompson Publishing in, in 1996. So later when I would be lectured about US government officials about how US you know, didn't do compulsory licenses or you had to have some ridiculous uh, public health catastrophe to justify it, I, 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 you know, I, I just, we just did one. And then I did a, a follow-up one the next year with Microsoft on the browser case. So, um, and that was a, the remedy to that was a compulsory license uh, on, uh, uh, on protocols and things that related to working with the Microsoft operating system. So kind of a long ways from the medicine cases, but um, uh, the next big case I worked on was the Hazel Tau case, which was <laughs> mentioned. I was invited by um, TAC to be an expert in the case and submit an affidavit. And then uh, the commission actually hired me uh, 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 to head up a group to evaluate the complaint. And several people here, turns out, were, were part of that case at that point. Now, uh, the, um, can you read this okay? Let me see. It's a little small right there. Um, uh, we, we were supposed to evaluate the Hazel Town case. At one point, uh, we had, as experts on the case, uh, Ashel uh, Prapala, uh, uh, Professor Yaman from Harvard School of Public Health, Iris Boutras, Juan Rivera, uh, 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 his Oxford public interest lawyers, including uh, Shamed, uh, Shamir uh, Bashir, who a lot of people know who he is. Um, um, Michael Palmeta, who's been hanging around here today, Aidan Hollis, Brooke Baker, Carlos Correa, Professor Shear up at Harvard, Jerry Reichman, who's standing sitting right over there, um, uh, Professor Sandra F Friedman, Professor uh, Billy Jack at, uh, at Georgetown then, Rob Weissman, who's been here today, Sean Flynn, who's one of the organizers of the event, who was the lead lawyer for us on this uh, case, uh, Shuba Gosh, I think is also here this week, I think somebody told me, and through Bala Subaru, and runs our Geneva office. So these are just, uh, now, all these people actually had expert reports in this case, but they were under seal until a few years ago when uh, Lottie uh, from TAC uh, filed a freedom of information request to uh, make these things public. So now all of these reports from all these people. Uh, did I mention um, uh, one thing I left off here is Professor uh, um, Eleanor Fox is, uh, should be on that list as well from uh, NYU, is a big antitrust expert. And uh, these were, uh, I wasn't pro bono, but I think we were billing out at $150 a day, is how we were billing our time out. But most of the people that worked in this case did it for free because they thought the case was so important. Um, I want to uh, just show you uh, briefly uh, from the evaluation. I created a, a table here of, uh, I created a table of, just the tables from um, the excessive pricing evaluation that, uh, that, that I, that one of, just one of the parts of the case. And there was um, 13 different tables. I'm just gonna show you um, this table right here. Uh, um, one of the approaches we took in the, in the Hazel Tau case was the commission was a little concerned about regulating everything because the statute's quite broad and uh, it covers milk, haircuts, cars, oil and gas, I mean, everything. And so they, they were kind of concerned about the precedent. They, they were very moved by the, uh, by the power of the attack case and the mobilization. And they wanted uh, to do the case. They never done a case on, on excessive pricing at the time. Um, so we pre I presented this, uh, this matrix, which was, a, you put goods in two categories. There was intellectual property goods on the one hand, and those were things that you could copy at a low cost, like a drug, for example, or software, or, or, or journals or textbooks, or a you know, music CD. And then you had physical goods and services, um, like housing or uh, uh, doctor services and things like that. And we said that the difference was that if it's an intellectual property good, it, you're not like trying to force someone to provide you a haircut or give you a gasoline. You're basically asking if they have a right to prevent you from doing something. If it's a limitation on the freedom to, to make their own chair, you know, or to uh, build their own house. I mean, it's a, it's a different kind of a thing. So we said that the, the privilege of a monopoly uh, should be dependent on a test uh, that would be different than it would be for physical goods and services. And um, we also had things into essential, non-essential, and luxury goods as these different categories. And, and, and of course, in the Hazel Town case, HIV drugs were in this 
sweet spot of intellectual property goods, things you could copy for free, they were essential. Uh, and, and, and so that was really made it much easier for the commission to decide to implement a very uh, far-reaching and very important reform. It, the Hazel Tau case essentially led to all of Sub-Saharan Africa having first-line treatments for about, a, you know, I mean, that was just really what changed everything, that case. Um, there was quite a few other aspects of this, including the defenses and um, uh, b different benchmarks and things. And I, you can, I'm not going to belabor the case any further than that. Um, um, but I, I just talk about a few other things, and I just want to check to make sure. Uh, how much time do I have? Four minutes? Okay. I'll, I'll try and keep within the four. Um, uh, we, we've, uh, I was involved in the uh, Bayer Nexavar case in India, and in that case, um, I, I think it was a competition case because there is a an excessive. I think it was an excessive pricing case because there was a statutory requirement in India that you have to make products available uh, uh, at prices that are reasonably affordable. So the issue I was brought in as an expert for is was. Um, I forget how much it was, 50,000 or whatever the number was per year. Is that reasonably affordable in India? And I felt that was one of the easier uh, jobs I'd ever had to ask because the per capita income at the time was, I think, less than $100 a month or something like that. So, um, and that case was appealed up to the Supreme Court. And then, and then I think the, the problem with that case has been that the political f feedback from the U.S. has been so that the Ahmadi government is sort of not done more of these cases, but it was a, it was an important precedent as to how you evaluate, and I, I'm not going to go through all the details. There's cases, there's a lot of cases we've been involved in where we've, we've, we've lost. For example, we opposed Celgene, which is a big bio, a big drug company in the United States, from acquiring a company called Juno. Now, Celgene was developing its own um, uh, CAR-T treatment for multiple myeloma uh, around a certain, I think, CD30 protein or something like that, or maybe a, it was maybe a different, no, maybe it's a different protein, but anyway, I can't remember all the science part, but they were identical to a competitor that, that, that Juno had, and they were going to basically and do the same thing. CAR-T is a treatment where they take your, your blood, isolate your T cells, modify them, inject them back in your body, and it either kills you or cures you from an incurable form of cancer. It's really... A, a very promising um, line of therapy. The first ones put in the market were priced at $363,000 and $475,000 per treatment. So we, we, we didn't want uh, Celgene to control both the technologies. The FTC was one that reviewed the merger. and We thought we were going to get them to hold it up, but they said that they couldn't consider a pipeline product as competitors because neither product had been approved by the FDA. Even though Celgene paid $9 billion, essentially, for this technology, um, which we thought was evidence that was not too nebulous, actually, um, in that particular case. I, I could go on for a while, I, and some of our stories are, are bad stories, like, for example, our attempt to, to get investigation of the Shire collusion with uh, Sanofi and the ICANN School of Medicine uh, in New York uh, to prevent competition in the U.S. market for, uh, for Fabrizyn. But I'll stop now. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. This was just an appetizer. This is a short introduction. I have a further discussion. We can further elaborate on these cases. Our next speaker is Dr. Patmachi Reid Sampat. She's a fellow at the Bergman Klein Center at Harvard University with publications and expertise in the industries of economics, trade, technology, and intellectual property. She's also an adjunct professor at the University of Arctic in Denmark. She was, until recently, Nations Conference on Trade and Development team that developed the Anctad Report on Technology and Innovation. Dr. Sampat's uh, presentation will focus on the data and the findings of her uh, latest research. Thank you. Okay, this seems to be on. Um, so, um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, um, thank you very much to Judith for um, inviting me to be on this panel. And um, 
My presentation today will focus on um, the question of patents and uh, rising market concentration, looking at some issues of relevance for policy. Um, I just want to start by giving you a bit of a background. So um, The Economist in 2016 produced um, at least two short opinion pieces. There were a couple now in 2017. But these were about how corporate profits and returns on capital are at a near record level in the United States. The concern was that high profits are not entirely due to innovative investments, but due to market power or reduced competition, and that incumbents in certain sectors are becoming more entrenched. The Council of Economic Advisors of the US, similarly in 2016, issued a brief about the decline in competition. These studies, among many others, since then make the point that industry concentration has risen and that the firms seem to enjoy greater rents. But at the same time, these rising rents have not attracted firm entry or more competition in key market segments. So is there a problem with the market? Um, while we continue to discuss this and debate it and scratch the problem on the surface, there are some really worrying trends. If you take many high-tech sectors, what you really see is that profitable companies 10 years ago are still the profitable companies today, and the profitable companies today are likely to be profitable 10 years later. And all major industries seem to be characterized by more and more stratification. So, um, but these major market changes are not happening in isolation. They're happening in the context, in the backdrop of a number of policy changes that are facilitating this move. And some of those are related to the global trade regime and the intellectual property policy and reforms that we are seeing since 1995. So, um, Professor Walter Park of the American University and myself, we embarked on a study where we tried to look at a couple of questions. Actually, um, Walter is here in the room with us. So we tried to embark on a, on a study where we look at a couple of the questions. Are these high profits or rents, uh, uh, the rents that accrue from innovation or their sign of sickness, such as the abuse of monopoly power? And are there policy changes particularly induced through IP regimes and TRIPS plus agreement that help to cement these profits? Now, I want to just, <clears throat> so first, I, I'm, before I present the results of our study, I want to put it against the backdrop of what's happening globally in terms of um, the rise of non-financial firms. So what's changing in global markets from 1995 to 2015? Now here in this figure, I am showing the share of surplus profits in total profits. And you see the amount of surplus profits that go to the top 100 non-financial firms over time from 1995 has increased significantly if you look at it till 2015. And if you take a look at, these are all firms, you know, top 100 firms in all sectors in 56 countries in the world, developed, developing and transition economies. And if you took, take that and take a look at what's happening parallelly with the intellectual property regime, in 1995, we start with the TRIPS agreement. You have gradual accession and widespread employment of IP reforms in countries from 2000 onwards. You have actually certain kinds of uh, um, regulatory reforms in the US and in developed economies like the America Invents Act, which culminated in 2012, 2013. And these are being then transformed through regulatory harmonization with partner countries in free trade agreements, okay? Now, and what does this mean really when we say that the surplus profits are rising? This is what it really means in terms of market con concentration indices, right? So what you see here is the rise in other assets of these top 100 firms, which is the green line. You see a rise in physical asset holdings, which is the orange line. You see a rise in revenues, which is the blue line. But you do not see a rise in employment, which is the point that I think Professor Susan Sell made in the previous um, session. So we are looking at a financialization of global economy. And so against this backdrop, in our study, we, talk, we, we, asked, we provide an early look at the effect of patent rights and activity on this kind of market concentration and firm profitability using data on global companies. So um, what we look at is two basic questions. One is, has there been more entry of affiliates of foreign companies into industrialized markets? And have indigenous companies in the developing world gained participation in global technological markets? And are patents stifling competition in key sectors? 
which, as Stiglitz says, should be a global public good. We use four countries in our analysis. We look at the US market and three emerging economies, India, Brazil, and China. We construct two separate data sets. I'm not going to go into the details of how we construct the data, what we look at. We, I mean, in the paper, we do really do more serious econometric analysis. I'm running out of time. So I'm just going to go and present a few results, OK? Now, the first set of results we find is, first, we find that the concentration of patent ownership is significantly related to market concentration in the United States of America. So in this, basically what what we really find is that in the pharmaceutical sector in the United States, when we take all the firms, domestic and foreign, we find that the mean sales of the top 20% is about 170 times the mean sales of the middle 20% from 2009 to 2014. That's the difference in the amount of sales. Then we also look at in the pharmaceutical sector, we find that a US parent company typically receives the most US patent grants. And we find that the concentration of patent ownership is with, within the leading firms related, it leads to actually market concentration. So although per se you can't say that, you know, patents lead to market concentration, what we find is that when firms concentrate their patent ownership, it leads to more market concentration. Because those patents then, they together act to facilitate the dominant position of the leading firms. Okay. And then we look at, so what, um, in the case of uh, other countries, Brazil, India, and China, in our sample, we're not able to directly look at market concentration because the data is not sufficient. So what we look at is what is happening to the sales growth of American multinational company affiliates. How does that link to patent reforms in these countries, okay? And what is happening to the rate of return of these firms? So here I have some graphs which show you that. So here we look at affiliate sales growth as linked to patent reforms. This graph shows what's happening in Brazil. So the red line shows the patent reform index, where we try to capture how the patent regime in the country is strengthening over time, okay? And the blue line shows you what's happening to the median sales growth, okay? So here you can see that related to the patent reforms, you are seeing a rise in the revenues or sales growth of uh, US multinational affiliates. You see almost the same trend in India, and then you see the same trend here in China, right? Then the second set of results we have, we look at what is happening to the affiliates of US multinational companies um, and their local counterparts. So when you have these patent reforms, what happens to the local companies and what is the rate of return, right? Now, this is the case of Brazil here. The blue line now shows what is the rate of return of MNC affiliates in Brazil, US MNC affiliates in Brazil. And the red line shows the rate of return of local companies, okay? So you see that the blue line is obviously um, increasing, the red line is, is, is going down. You see a similar trend in the case of India, and you see a, 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 the same, almost the same trend in the case of China. Now, another interesting set of results that I have no time to go into is the question of what's happening to R&D intensity. Because although what we find is that although the rate of return of US MNC affiliates is increasing over time with patent reforms in, in these domestic economies, there is no increase in their R&D intensity, okay? So this is another result that we find. So I'd like to summarize briefly and leave you with a few uh, thoughts, okay? So first one is, what is actually then the use for these domestic economies when they, rate, when they implement patent reforms, if they don't have greater access, and if you don't see greater R&D intensity that is of relevance to these economies? This is a question that we raise in the paper. This, I mean, this is a question that has been there since the inception of the TRIPS agreement, but this is something that is even more critical today. The second question is, global markets are changing, and we are looking at that. The markets are not the same that they were in 1995. They're far more stratified, and there's much more of market power in markets today. So what is the role of competition policy in this context, and how should we articulate it? Shouldn't it be much more stronger than ever before? 
The third question that our analysis raises is that it's not just a question of capabilities anymore. These are three markets we are looking at where firms are capable. They're capable of production and they're able to also patent. What we really need to now see is whether markets are functioning, whether markets are able to create a fair basis for competition, and whether the rents that come out of this process are innovative. Now, that's something we are not able to analyze in our paper because there's no way to benchmark what are the deadweight losses of the grant of an intellectual property, particularly patent, and what should be the benefits of that. But maybe we can regulate markets in a different way. So these are some of the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sampat. And our last uh, speaker, Professor Frederick Abbott, is a professor of international law at Florida State University College of Law. Professor Abbott is the author of numerous publications on international economic law, intellectual property rights law, health regulation, and public international law. Professor Abbott has served and serves as an expert advisor on numerous governments and international organizations, including for UNDP and competition law and policy. He's the co-chair of the Committee on Global Health Law uh, of the International Law Association and has chaired many other distinguished initiatives. Professor Abbott will conclude this first part of the panel discussions presenting on an overview of the new developments and trends in competition law and practices, including on standards for excessive pricing of pharmaceuticals and the most significant jurisprudence, jurisprudence and case law. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judith. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to be with so many friends and colleagues uh, in the room. Uh, I want to quickly make an additional note about the production of the UNDP guidebook on using competition law to promote access to medicines. Um, uh, very instrumental in that project was Judith's predecessor, Katie Kirk. As many of you may know, Katie Kirk died suddenly and expectedly after heading on mission to Ethiopia. Uh, for UNDP about two years ago, uh, but I'd just like to invoke her memory. Uh, she played a very important role in, in getting UNDP started on access to uh, using competition law as well as the UN uh, high-level panel on access to medicines. So I'm not sure whether it's – can I get some technical assistance? This doesn't seem to be showing up on the screen in terms of – No, it's not moving the slides. I mean, not. Uh, it, it does not work on the back. Okay. Right. Apologies for the technical delay. No worries. Well, all right. We'll do the best we can. So, um, I've been encouraged to, to talk at a, a fairly high level of generality because there may be people in the room who aren't so familiar with competition law, but I'm going to mainly not follow that um, imprecation because I think actually there is a high level of expertise in the room. Uh, and at least the second part of my presentation will be devoted to uh, some uh, fairly technical mm -hmm. issues concerning competition law doctrine. Uh, but to start with, in a, a fairly quick overview of the 
uh, current situation. Uh, we know that the global pharmaceutical market is characterized by multiple failures, political, economic, regulatory, scientific, uh, which requires that we use a competition law which is not a unidimensional. And by unidimensional, I, I refer to the focus on uh, elimination of uh, producer constraints. Uh, because this is If we go back to early U.S. Supreme Court jurisdiction on uh, ju uh, jurisprudence on competition law, in the early 1900s, the cases were really directed to the protection of consumers. So if you read the early Supreme Court case, uh, Standard Oil, uh, you'll see that the focus of the court uh, was on the impact that the conspiracy or the uh, combination of trust would have on prices and how that would affect consumers. Uh, in the mid-1980s, the United States really shifted through the influence of the Chicago School and Robert Bork uh, to emphasizing the self-correcting nature of markets. And the general theory of the Chicago School was and remains that if you eliminate uh, restraints as between producers and create a competitive cr producer market, uh, that will induce competition and lower prices and ultimately benefit consumers. Um, and this Chicago school, for better or worse, continues to permeate discourse on competition law, both in the United States and the international level. And why this is important, we'll revert to that a little bit later. Uh, but the, the key point I would like to make is that where markets are characterized as the pharmaceutical market by legislatively authorized grants of exclusive rights, whether that's patents or exclusive marketing rights, removing constraints as between producers does not result in lower prices to consumers. You actually have to go directly at the higher prices themselves, which will uh, referred to for the sake of argument as excessive pricing and, and refer back to that. To talk a little bit about trends, there's a tremendous amount going on in this area, uh, certainly since UNDP started it, its active work on competition law uh, five or six years ago. Uh, perhaps just a little bit before that uh, was the EU Competition Directorate uh, investigation of the role of patents and other market exclusivity mechanisms. And of course, the US Federal Trade Commission really uh, worked on those issues, even preceding what the EU did. And the EU is continuing, continuously monitoring and challenging uh, patent settlements. The Dutch government is in the middle of an investigation on the pricing impact of pat patent extensions and regulatory exclusivity rules. Uh, the EU Competition Directorate has opened up what it refers to as a unique investigation into the pricing practices of South Africa's Aspen Pharmaceuticals, and it specifically refers to excessive pricing as an exceptional circumstance. The major, uh, the leader in excessive pricing investigation is the UK Competition and Markets Authority, and I'm going to come back to that because that's the specific doctrinal issue I want to discuss in more detail. We've, the Italian Competition Authority uh, also has been quite active, including finding Aspen uh, uh, guilty of excessive pricing and imposing fines. The French Competition Authority is in the midst of a pharmaceutical uh, sector inquiry. Some colleagues of all of ours uh, involved in the Dutch Pharmaceutical Accountability Foundation have just asked there competition authority to take action against Lediant Biosciences uh, in respect to uh, excessive pricing. The South Africa Competition Commission, as we mentioned, um, as has been mentioned, has opened up a large-scale investigation in the health sector, a very complex investigation. Uh, for those involved in the IP policy, its development and implementation, competition law is, is factored significantly into that. Um, as uh, um Umanya mentioned as well, there's other actions currently under review in South Africa. And among other things, UNDP hosted a multi-country consultation in Pretoria back in 2016. 
Uh, one of the most active competition authorities is the Chinese competition authorities, and there's actually three agencies in China that work on competition matters, MOFCOM, the NDRC, and the SAIC. Uh, and they've been quite active, including both in the ordinary restraints of trade and in excessive pricing. Um, we can go into some, some more detail about what all of these people are doing, but I, this is just basically introdu introduction. Uh, the Competition Commission of India is doing a baseline study of the self sector. They had an opened an investigation at, on Herceptin. Uh, the status of that isn't entirely clear. A very active competition authority in Malaysia, the MYCC, um, UNDP hosted, again, a consultation for the ASEAN countries about a year ago. Uh, they just produced a pharmaceutical sector study. A lot of the groundwork in that was done by uh, TWN. Uh, and they've also just uh, are in the process of developing guidelines on IP and competition in which UNDP has also submitted comments and participated. And then in December of last year, um, we also conducted a large consultation in Latin America in uh, Rio de Janeiro with, again, a number of people in this room. And so in that consultation, we had, we had presentations by every competition authority in Latin America on what they're doing. And, and so, you know, these are trends in two minutes. We're not at this stage really going into uh, precisely uh, what they're uh, doing. Some of the bigger, more interesting cases going on right now, uh, United, the state's attorney generals in the United States, and there's also a criminal investigation by the Department of Justice against a broad range of generics companies. And if you were going to write a case book about restraints in the pharmaceutical sector, you only need to read the detailed complaint of the state's attorney generals against the uh, generic sector, um, the, you know, uh, restrictions of supply, uh, extensive text messaging and meetings about fixing prices, uh, 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 rigging, bidding uh, to the pharmaceutical benefit providers, uh, informal meetings, uh, actually referred to as girls' nights out uh, among the uh, pharmaceutical producers uh, to uh, have discussions about price fixing. And so this is going to be really a major case. And a, a, a number of the companies that, again, many of us have liked to think about of friends of uh, the access movement are very heavily impacted by this competition investigation. Uh, I won't go into this, but you know the, the powers of the Canadian pri Patented Price Review Board have been recently upheld. Um, the most active prosecutor of competition cases is the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, the Health Antitrust Division here in Washington. And um, I really have to give a lot of credit to this group because they are fighting against Big Pharma. They are working persistently, being fought every step of the way in every case, all the way through appeals to the Supreme Court. Um, if, if, again, you want to see the worst types of human behavior, read the settlement in FTC, the Malincrot, and the excessive pricing of a liver treatment for children. Um, it's just horrific um, to think that a group of adult human beings could engage in conduct of that type, and the FTC got a major settlement against them and a compulsory license for the medicine. Um, recently won a case, at least at the district level, of uh, sham patent litigation against AbbVie, uh, that its lawyers uh, knowingly and willfully uh, uh, secured patents and used them in uh, paragraph four litigation to prevent the entry of generics and a $400 million plus fine. Um, again, just to briefly mention, uh, you now even have, I call it bio on bio. Uh, this is uh, Johnson, uh, Pfizer against Johnson and Johnson alleging uh, uh, abusive behavior in restricting the uh, right of health insurers to provide reimbursement for uh, biogenerics. I'm um, not going to go into details, but that's a current case. Uh, 
Now I'm finally getting to the point of my presentation. So, um, <laughs> so this is what I regard as the single most important competition action going on today, which, which uh, portends to have very significant uh, implications. Uh, and this is uh, the Competition Market Authority in the United Kingdom against Pfizer. Um, and the uh, CMA uh, had made a determination against Pfizer for uh, excessive pricing uh, in a case involving something called uh, phenytoin sodium capsules. Uh, these are an older anti-epilepsy drug by, but used by almost uh, 50,000 patients in the UK. Um, and it was a very low price drug, and it was kind of a unique setting, a therapeutic setting, because it's a drug that uh, it is risky uh, not only to switch to a different drug, but it's even very risky to sh shift between a capsule form and a tablet form, and it is preferable to stay with precisely the same formulation, and that was the recommendation of their uh, medicines board. So uh, what Pfizer did in this case, they could have negotiated a price increase with the National Health Service, but they decided that they wouldn't get enough of a price increase. So they decided what they would do was engage in a process called debranding. And this is a more or less unique British process. Um, it, it engaged an intermediary called Flynn. Uh, and it transferred its marketing authorization to Flynn and then entered into a contractual purchase relationship with Flynn. But because they didn't transfer the brand of the brand name drug to Flynn, but only the marketing authorization, under British law, this took the drug out of the price control system and allowed them to price the drug however they wanted. And what they did then between Pfizer and Flynn was they raised the price of this anti-epilepsy drug by approximately 2,500%. So the cost of the NHS went from 2 million pounds to 50 million pounds in one year. Uh, and that uh, change persisted. And in the course of the investigation and the discussion, uh, the Pfizer executives literally talked about what is the public going to think about our fleecing the NHS uh, during a time of budgetary crisis in the UK? So this was, in a way, kind of the worst case scenario in generic price manipulation and the Competition and Marketing Authority. So now we have to understand a little bit about um, the United Brands case, but we'll just do really quickly, I don't know even if I have a minute, but three minutes, okay. So what the CMA said was, well, we, well, in the United Brands Standard, which goes back to the late 1970s and the uh, uh, Court of Justice of the European Union now under what is now Article 102, the EU always does us the favor of changing the numberings of the treaties to make everybody crazy. But anyway, uh, they used, they made a cost plus determination of the benchmark price of what the drug price should reasonably have been. And then they looked at that cost price plus price and then looked at the price that Pfizer and Flynn were charging for the drug and said, uh, we have no difficulty concluding that that price is excessive, right? That the 2,500% price increase was excessive, in particular because Pfizer showed no reason why there should be a price increase. They're providing exactly the same drug from exactly the same factory. Um, in exactly the same formulation, so there was no reason for a price increase. But under the United Brands Standard, there's a second prong to the uh, uh, legal analysis. You not only have to show that a price is excessive, you also have to show it is unfair. And you can show, so unfairly excessive. And you can show it is unfairly excessive in one of two ways. You can either show it is excessive and unfair in itself, or you can show it is unfair in comparison to other uh, competitive drugs on the market. But the European Court of Justice made it very clear that only one of those tests need to be satisfied. So in the United Brands case, again, which is the 
main jurisprudence of the uh, European Court of Justice. You've got a two-pronged test. The Court of Justice specifically said that, that cost plus is the best mechanism for establishing a benchmark, number one. And number two, you can show unfairness in one of these two ways, which I won't repeat. Um, the decision of uh, the Competition and Market Authority, which goes to 550 pages and is in excess, excessive technical detail, um, rejects, it, 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 it uh, validates the finding of dominant position by Pfizer and Flynn. So they controlled the market and consumers didn't have a realistic alternative, they were locked in. But it rejected the excessive pricing determination. And it rejected the excessive pricing determination based on an opinion written by the Advocate General to the, to the court named Wall, and Wall citing Justice Scalia in his Trinco opinion in the United States said that if you reduce producer constraints, markets are self-correcting, and excessive pricing really isn't a thing, but because the CJEU has said it's a thing before, I'm gonna, I'm gonna agree that it's a thing, but it's a thing that's very difficult to prove. And he went on to say that it's not only required that you prove it in the way that the CJEU has said you had to prove it in the past, but I'm going to require I think you should perform multiple analysis on each prong even if the test has already been satisfied by the prong that was laid out by the Court of Justice of the European Union. So that wasn't accepted by the Court of Justice in what that Advocate General opinion was for, the Latvian copyright case, which in fact set a lower standard for excessive pricing. Um, but trying to compress this all, the <laughs> Court of Appeals, uh, the, the Competition Appellate Tribunal, uh, relying on Advocate General Wall's opinion said, it wasn't enough for Pfizer to use a, a cost plus formula for determining whether the price was excessive. And it wasn't enough for the competition authority to show that the price was unfair in itself because Pfizer provided absolutely no justification for the price increase because everything stayed the same except the price. And even went a step further and said the drug is cheaper in every other European market, um, which presumably would have even satisfied the second prong, but that the Competition and Markets Authority should have done something else, even though it couldn't quite articulate what that something else was. Now, why am I mentioning this? Why do I say this is the most important case? Well, uh, with UNDP and others, I, I've met with competition authorities in, on every continent and, well, I don't know, Antarctica, if that's a continent or whatever. But, um, and the group of people who are the main competition authorities and competition judiciary study the same cases. They tend to think a lot alike. Uh, they tend to very much like the jurisprudence of the European Court of Justice. And I would say, quite importantly, the South Africa Competition Act is, ex is expressly modeled on the decision in the United Brands case. So South Africa took that multi-pronged test and put it into its Competition Act, and its competition tribunal looks to the jurisprudence of the European Court of Justice in making its decisions. And it is a fairly conservative tribunal, all things being equal. So we had the Hazel Taw case. That didn't go up to the competition tribunal in South Africa. But there are some big cases coming down the pike, potentially, including with respect to anti-cancer drugs. And when they go up to the competition tribunal, because I don't think the companies are going to let them lie now, they're potentially going to be confronted with this evolving, potentially conservative jurisprudence on excessive pricing coming out of the United Kingdom and potentially even out of the European Court of Justice. So um, there's other cases. Um, again, 
for me, the key antitrust doctrine for access to medicines is excessive pricing. Because, again, to reiterate, if you're looking at patented medicines and exclusive marketing rights granted medicines, the companies probably aren't engaged in intercorporate collusion or restraints of trade. They are using a legislatively granted authority to charge a price which is beyond a reasonable price, an excessive price. And unless you can go after excessive pricing, which incidentally you really can't do in the United States, so we'll leave that aside, but I'm hoping to change that before I die, but probably won't. Um, you have to look at a complex analysis under patent law. So I apologize if that was more technically detailed than perhaps it should have been, uh, and maybe we can come back to it. But uh, I, I just want to be aware that there's a lot of positive stuff going on in this field, but there's also some considerable risk from a doctrinal standpoint that competition authorities are confronted with. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Thank you. That was an incredible panel. Um, I, I know we've been unfair with all of you. I mean, in summarizing this knowledge and experience in most of you uh, within time frames of uh, 10 to 15 minutes. But I think it's important that we open the discussion. I mean, we, what we learn in this panel is we have the legal and the political space and the, and the policy space, apologies. We have the need, the data is showing increased market concentration and the public returns on that market concentration are uh, negative, I will argue. Uh, we have experience uh, leading civil society organization in the United States and in, in South Africa and in other countries, as well as, of course, governments uh, have tried and are trying to use these tools. Um, this audience, I will argue, is mostly academic and civil society. What are the roles, uh, what are the questions that the academic community as well as what are the roles that civil society can play in promoting the tool of competition law and broadening the tools. I will say in Agenda 2030, the use of competition law is not an option, it's becoming an imperative. So how can we react, um, or how can we increase uh, its use at a country level, mostly in developing countries, to increase access to medicines and innovation? What have we learned? So this is an open question. Um, what are the barriers for scaling up the use? Has the tool been neglected, and if yes, why? Uh, Professor Correa? Okay, yeah. yes, let me start. Um, well, in fact, in, in many developing countries, the tradition in competition law is quite weak. And many countries adopted legislation quite recently. As, as I mentioned before, the UNCTAD set of principles was quite influential. UNCTAD secretariat provided a lot of advice to many countries. But um, there isn't the tradition that you can find in the United States or in Europe or in other countries in uh, implementing um, competition law. So this is one factor that may affect the, um, the activism of uh, competition authorities in this respect. Uh, I think uh, there, is, um, there is a space to be, uh, to be used. Um, one, one action, for instance, that may be envisaged is to look at possible guidelines for the competition authorities. Uh, to deal uh, with cases that relate to intellectual property abuse, in particular patents abuse. Um, there, are, there are already some guidelines approved in some developed countries uh, on these issues. Uh, not necessarily these should be the good models, but there are good elements that uh, may be taken out of, of this. For instance, in, in Japan, in the United States, also in South Korea, there are guidelines that, on this uh, aspect. This, this could be something else that, in addition to the book that you have published, that might be quite useful uh, because um, uh, it is likely that uh, authorities in competition authorities in developing countries, they really have not faced cases like this. They have, of course, the possibility of act ex officio. They don't need necessarily to have a, um, a particular individual or company uh, bringing a case. And therefore, uh, this kind of, um, of policy making could be uh, extremely useful. Um, sorry. Um, okay. Um, I'm just well. I'd just like to throw something out here. Um, I'm wondering if we're not framing the question of competition policy wrong. Um, I mean, if you if you look at it from the perspective of creating competitive markets, competitive markets for innovation, 
and competitive markets that bring down the price and promote access, uh, then the perspective on competition law and policy since the TRIPS agreement, or maybe even before, and Professor Correa can correct me here, has been on how to curb the excesses of IP. And I think that maybe we should, we should really think about how competition policy can be a complement to intellectual property rights regimes and create competitive markets for the production of goods, products, innovative ideas, outcomes, and promote access. Um, I would say um, it may be a neglected tool, but it's also a very complex tool to use for civil society. And it requires us, in some respects, to become experts, just as we became experts on the science of HIV, on the law of patents, we must become experts, um, even if we're lay experts, to understand the issues. Um, and utilize that knowledge to, to create a public debate around the use of these kinds of tools um, and engage the public. I think a critical thing is to win the public debate um, and to bring the public along with us as activists. Um, and also engage with the governments. Um, we do this all the time. We engage parliamentarians. We talk to ministers and technocrats um, in government departments and get them onto our side. Um, and parliamentarians are very interested in these types of tools because their mandate when they go back to their constituencies is to bring healthcare services um, and to, to ensure um, that people who are in their constituencies are getting access to cancer drugs. These are the questions that are coming up now um, with, uh, with the cost of cancer drugs going, becoming incredibly unaffordable. Um, and with the use of, of tools like the Health Market Inquiry, which also just breaks open a whole debate about the way the private sector operates in general in healthcare and what the duties are of those, of those private actors. One thing that we've asked the Health Market Inquiry to include in their final report is something on the private obligations. What are the private obligations of, what are the constitutional obligations of private actors um, in an economy that involves, in a, in a market rather that involves access to a human right, which is the right to healthcare services. Thank you. So, Professor um, Abbott, you wrote an article quite recently that kind of highlights some of the key barriers that you see in developing countries and scaling up the use of competition law. You, you highlighted one of the issues that you highlighted with the lack of data and the importance of transparency. I was wondering if you could develop a little bit more. What are the best practices on increasing access to data? How important is data in building competition cases? Well, competition cases are all about data. Um, uh, whatever type of, of, of action you're pursuing. And so <clears throat> I, I'll quickly just mention uh, three or four things that, that, again, this comes from a panoply of discussion across authorities. One of the remarkable things is that um, many competition authorities really do not have the, the power to compel the production of evidence. They can only ask for it. So. Uh, this becomes a major obstacle. Sometimes they can get a decision from a judge or the head of the competition authority, but generally it's not like it is in the United States or Europe where the competition authority has the power to compel. That's a very important part of the investigatory toolkit. Um, when we've tried to initiate and conduct comparative pricing studies, we are routinely told, or investigators are routinely told, that we can't give you pricing information because we signed a contract with the company and it's a trade secret and we've promised not to disclose it. And it would be a legal violation to disclose the price of the, the drug. Now, the company's justification is, well, if they tell the price, then people will know how to undercut our price, which is an argument to think about. But even if we're looking at the simple things about what's patented, which we're, some progress is being made on, and what the term of exclusivity is, those are, that's difficult information to assemble. A key issue, which is true in many areas, of course, is that competition authorities tend to be underfunded. And so, you know, 
pursuing a case like the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, which costs literally millions of dollars, is something that just may be outside of the reach of many uh, competition authorities. Uh, and finally, I would just mention that one of the biggest risks today is a new push by some governments for the negotiation of inter international competition law standards, which in my view is not being done to help uh, pursue investigations, but being done to impose process constraints and doctrinal constraints. And as a developing country, I would be very wary of these negotiation efforts. So Jamie, last question for me, one on biologics. When patents are not the only barrier to competition, we'll have trade secrets, uh, we have um, regulatory strategies and barriers um, that are limiting access to vaccines, to insulins, apart from the traditional intellectual property barriers. What is the role of competition law and policy? Uh, you know, I think as Fred's uh, uh, survey and, and, and the comments by the other panel members, Carlos, and, and you know, what's happening in South Africa and, and all this this work and your work, you know, it, it makes it clear that there's there's a wide range of things that governments could explore with competition law, and so um, uh, and it varies a little bit from country to country in terms of what their their jurisdiction is. But the, the fundamental problem is we we've just completed a survey with some members of Congress on biologic drug competition in the United States. And um, we looked at all the drugs that were put on the market from 2005 to 2000, um, 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 2015, I guess, a 10-year period, an 11-year period. And we asked for, yeah, for all the drugs in that sample, um, how many face competition for the same API in terms of drugs over the, uh, by the end of 2017. So we had 11 years worth of drugs. Some of them were biologics and some of them were, were small molecules. And for the small molecules, um, I forget the exact percentage, but a fairly high percentage of them uh, faced some competition for some. Uh, uh, and the competition occurred normally after about 10 years. For the biologics, uh, they only had about 15% of them had any competition with the same API, and the competition took place about six years later. And uh, they, they, uh, the number of, average number of competitors for the biologics was about one and a half, and it was about nine for the uh, small molecules in the U.S. market. So what you have in biologics is you have, you have entry taking place less frequently. When it does, it takes place later, and you have fewer competitors. Uh, so a system of incentives, which is a temporary monopoly, which is uh, supposed to work the same for both the, the biologics and small, small molecules, works very different for the biologics and the, the, the small molecules, even though the cost of the trials are, are, are roughly the same in both cases. Um, so uh, what, we've, what we're proposing, what we're shopping uh, you know, to people, and what, we've, we've, uh, what um, we presented to the WHO expert committees in different places, is as we think the governments have to mandate technology transfer, and, and we have a workshop on this tomorrow, where you force uh, the kind of technology transfer that allow a company to move its production from one, from one plant to another plant, but to all their competitors, so that when the, when, 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 you know, the temporary monopoly expires, it's legal that it, the, the, the practical monopoly also uh, uh, replaces, so that you know, small molecule and Biologic markets are not radically different in terms of the amount of competition you have. Those have to be done through government policies. The fact that the CREATES Act has mandated certain kinds of technology transfer, I think, is a good precedent because it's a, it's a, uh, gets into this area of trade secrecy and things like that. But I think that focusing on um, uh, the creeping, the creeping uh, assertions of trade secrecy, like in the U.S., the patent landscape on a biologic drug is considered a, a trade, you know, as confidential business information. You have to you have to pay money and sign a non-disclosure agreement if you want to have access to that, as opposed to the Orange Book system for uh, small molecules. So that's just really absurd. So I think that uh, focusing on on, on uh, mandating transparency of know-how, access to materials, and and all the uh, other information you need. Uh, which we'll talk about tomorrow is important.
questions, comments? Yeah, Professor Brook. Absolutely. Fred, Fred had mentioned that he thought that excessive pricing was uh, really uh, an, uh, an, uh, an, an area should be a priority to kind of work on that. And, and, and we tend to agree, but let, let me just give you a couple. I mean, what Brooke is brain is there are other ways to deal with that. So like, and I, and I think that's true, but let me just give a couple ways that we thought within the area of existing. Uh, Compulsory licenses sometimes can be issued whether the, if you think the price is excessive. That's one area, like the, for example, the uh, you know the next of our case and things. The, the standard we've sort of proposed for developing countries is to sort of cite the Doha Declaration, which was in August. Uh, a panel report was was published by the WHO, w, WTO that said that that constitutes a subsequent agreement among member states, and it's used to interpret the agreement even in the context of tobacco regulation. So that, that really shows how broad it is. Um, that there's a mandate that you have to implement your intellectual property laws to promote access to medicine for all. So we think, like in the TAC case, this was, came up, and in the India case it came up, does the price lead to access to medicine for all? That's an empirical test in a developing country. And, 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 um, uh, and so then the, 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 we, we would say the argument there that companies can charge whatever they want up to a point if they can show that in it, everybody has access. But if everyone, you know, if most people that need the thing don't have access, you can't argue the price is reasonable unless you have some sort of other argument why a price where most people won't have access for essential good is thing. I, I mean, if that's the standard in developed countries, which I believe it should be, and I believe it's what's mandated by the Doha Declaration in terms of the, uh, at least the should, you know, kind of requirement, I think that, that would be able to, it, it doesn't really work, I don't think, in a place with, a robust insurance system, including a lot of the Latin American countries, where you have you have a, a legal right to things, or in the United States or Europe, there you have to really dig a little deeper uh, to really address the incentive system. What we've proposed in these uh, NIH licenses, a three what we call a, a three step process for determining whether the price is excessive. Uh, uh, the first the first step is uh, if you do an uh, independent technology assessment. Is the, is, is the value of the product excessive relative to the benefit that it provides? Um, and this is particularly important when there's a mandate for government to provide insurance, because then you know the, the government's forced to buy something under a, in a lot of systems like in Medicare and things like that. So then if it's priced higher than the value, we think that would be one ground based on independent assessment. That's the first step. The second step we would have would be, is the incentive excessive? And by this, if you look, for example, at a product like Herceptin or Gleevec or um, a lot of rare disease products, um, uh, certainly the hepatitis C things, at a certain amount of revenue benchmarks, we would say that you'd have to say that the uh, that, that irregardless of what you think about the value of the product, the, the incentive itself is a separate test. And uh, we, we've argued in the, in the licensing cases for the U.S., which are by contract, that they after, after like say a billion dollars, for example, in a government uh, licensed product where the government's funded a lot of the research, that they lose a year of exclusivity for every half billion dollars in global sales after the first thing, with the idea that the incentive is excessive under the U.S. statutory framework for buy dole licenses. Thank and the third step would be uh, the access thing we mentioned earlier. Does the price actually lead to 
um, uh, uh, hardships uh, and access barriers in terms of excessive co-payments and the idea, that, for example, if drugs are ended up in tier three in the U.S. market or something like that, that would be the third test. But we think the, that's what we proposed in terms of the higher income countries. More questions from the audience or comments? Well, I'll go ahead. Uh, no? Okay. Yeah. Oh, come on. Yeah. Yes. Short comments, focus comments from the panel, and so we will allow for more discussion. Can I? So I'm going to quickly take the comments by Brooke and your comment really quickly. 
No. So I don't disagree. There are many other tools. One of the things I find frustrating, one of the reasons I'm focusing on competition is that legislators and executives have been very unwilling to act, and particularly unwilling to act in the face of extensive corporate lobbying. Competition authorities tend to be independent or quasi-independent, and you also have private rights of action. So I don't disagree that it's not the most efficient way to control prices. There are more efficient ways. But our Congress has been talking about doing something about pharmaceutical prices for the past 50 years, and we have another administration that's promised to do something about pharmaceutical prices, and they still haven't done one single thing except congratulate themselves that they may let your pharmacist tell you that there are cheaper drugs. That's the solution to our pharmaceutical pricing problem. Um, and, and, and of course, extending biologic exclusivity under the whatever it's going to be called, uh, the, uh, the new bilateral uh, whatever. Anyway, but yes, it's a big issue, but it's a different issue, and I appreciate the importance of it. Thank you for the comment about South Africa, which is a, which is a point I was trying to make briefly, which is that the competition tribunal in South Africa tends to be fairly conservative, and it, and it really needs a push. And it's getting a push through the activists, and it's getting a push by the competition authority that is now perhaps going to bring some very serious cases about anti-cancer drugs. And people need to be able to get through to the court, not on the, on the level the court is willing to have the conversation. Now, you make the point, the proof is difficult. So, I've done a lot of work on how you establish the proof of accessing prices of a patented product. I don't have all the answers. Jamie's more of an economist than I am and can probably tell you more about, you know, how you go about establishing the risk-adjusted reasonable price of a pharmaceutical product so that you've got a patented pharmaceutical so that you've got a benchmark. But the, the question is, in South Africa or elsewhere, are you going to try or not, right? And, and I'm willing to try. And we may not succeed. And I may not succeed. We may not succeed for 30 years. But maybe on the 35th year, we'll succeed. So it's not a, long, it's not a short-term thing. In the US, it's going to be a long-term thing. But I do, that's precisely why I was mentioning it, precisely because of what you said. Because the courts tend to be conservative. And if we're going to change things, we have to change how the courts think about these things. For least developed countries, which is a, a very good point, yes, you do want to have a more simplified process. And Jamie talked about the Nexavar case in uh, India, uh, where they were per particularly looking at unaffordability to the consumer as the test, as opposed to some other test of what is a reasonable price, let's say, for the German market. And those could be very different things. So there's different ways to go about it for different markets, and you could have a, a more accelerated type of process for a least developed country. Pat Matsui, and then I'm going to ask Carlos, and we're going to open up to the floor again. Yeah, I mean, I just want to add to uh, the last question on, on, on the generics problem. I think, honestly, if we use competition policy and court decisions to band-aid away individual problems and individual cases where we have issues with access and pricing, we're never going to get to a point where we have a brave jurisprudence for competition policy in developing countries. And I think the way we frame the problem can be informed by these cases, but it has to go back to the broader problem of how do we create competitive markets for pharmaceutical drugs of the kind that promote local capabilities and promote access to medicines. And, and for this, you know, you have to come back to the question of pricing because you cannot curb market power by looking at abuse of dominance, uh, dominant position like you have now in Western jurisprudence in developing countries or by looking at cost. You have to come back to the question of pricing. There's a paper actually which was written by um, uh, a person from the law faculty here at the American University last year, I think, uh, Kirkland. And he talks about how out of the two bases of determining market power, whether it is cost or it is price, we need to move back to the question of price. Governments have to say, 
this is how my market looks, and this is the information I have on the way competition is working on this market, and this is the kind of price that I find is accessible, affordable. This is what I want to regulate. And I think that's very important. And one of the things that, that we found, for instance, when we did this work that we did on market concentration is that on the surface of it, a lot of the markets, they don't look concentrated. But when you disaggregate and go down, you notice that there are very few players everywhere. And when you find that, you have to intervene, and you have to intervene more forcefully and systematically. Carol? Well, thank you. Well, I, I fully agree what we need is a competitive market, but this is not an end in itself. We need a competitive market in order to ensure access to medicines. So this is the end. And in order to get that, uh, we need a regulatory framework which is uh, coherent. Uh, for instance, as it was mentioned, if there is data exclusivity, which is not a requirement under TRIPS agreement, you will not have competition for a large number of years, even if there is no patent protection. So what you need really is to use all the tools which are available, including competition law uh, to the extent possible. And I certainly think that it will be very important to uh, work, uh, continue working in this idea that competition law is not just to, to protect competitors, it is there also to protect consumers, and this can be used as a means to increase affordability to medicines. Is, if this, if this is uh, taken as one of the objectives, as, as this may be the case of these legislations. Comments, questions, suggestions? Let me open up and then we will, ha you, we, we will have time to respond. No? Comments? Yeah, please. Okay. So <laughs> my question to the panel, and then we're going to make concluding remarks. So we talk a lot about excessive pricing in this panel, and I think it's an issue that, of course, is important. But what about the use of competition law as a tool for promotion of innovation? What about uh, use of competition law as a response for refusal to, to innovators, refusal to deal um, uh, so that's one question, and, and then concluding remarks. If you want to answer the question, you can, and if not, that's fine. The second is I, I really would like to build on what Uyunga, Uyunga was saying about the power of competition law as a unifying of campaigns, of sector inquiries, but also solidarity, sharing of data across countries and regions. Uh, and really, this is a room um, with a lot of history of activism uh, and a lot of history of, share, uh, of solidarity. So I want to, to put to the panel, but also to the audience, of how competition law could be used as a tool for sharing of experience, but also to creating movements around specific drugs or specific diseases, or specific, uh, specific questions that were seen across countries, like the high prices of insulin or some cancer products, and how we can generate this uh, exchange of experiences and knowledge across countries. Yes, I see a hand at the end. So I'm being told we're out of time, so I'm going to give one minute to each panelist. You can respond to the questions or make your concluding remarks, whatever you want to use with that minute. Uh, what are the, basically, how do we increase access to competition law and for what? What are the most strategic movements uh, in developing countries? Um, I'm going to start that way. Okay. <laughs> well, one minute is not uh, perhaps enough, but just uh, to refer to one of the issues that you raised, the role of competition in promoting innovation. Interestingly, one report by the Federal Trade Commission in 2003 about competition and patent law thus make the point that it's not just through monopolies that you promote innovation. Competition is a major driver of, of uh, innovation. And this aspect, I think, should be also, also stressed. I, I, I like your reference to refusal to deal. It perhaps it's too late to make a comment on this. But this is a very important doctrine. It should be part, for instance, of a legislation dealing with a compulsory license. This could this could be and should be one of the grounds for compulsory license. It has been uh, the case in some Italian uh, 
uh, decision, decision by the Italian authority on competition. So there are, there are a lot of elements that can be used in order to achieve both uh, innovation and uh, also um, access to uh, medicines in a context of a more, com more, more competitive markets. Thanks. So I think that we do need to have uh, better collaboration and better access to information. Um, and I'm sure many of you have spoken to Suri about um, bringing together research and addressing some of the paywalls that um, we that like are barriers for access to research articles to data um, that we need in order to to, to build cases. Um, whether using competition law or any other form of law or any other tool. Um, and so I think for us, you know, people in this room and at this conference, that's a key area for us to collaborate on. Um, and for the, the question that was rose about South Africa, I think the uh, sweet spot for the Competition Commission, and it certainly was when Deanne uh, Terrablanche was, uh, uh, was the head of enforcement, is to uh, focus on uh, the difference between all goods and essential goods and focus that there be different standards for essential goods. And secondly, different standards for goods that you can copy. So if, it's a, if a good is essential and it can be copied, it should be treated different than other goods. And I think that makes it easier to pursue a path uh, for in South Africa where they are concerned about the broader implications. In terms of uh, Judith's question about um, other areas, I think the emerging patent thickets in CAR-T and CRISPR uh, are quite uh, 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 dangerous and uh, 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 important, and I think that there should be a move for the kind of remedies you saw in the aircraft manufacturing case or in the radio scenario where you should be pushed toward mandatory pulling of patents in those areas. And you can learn something from what's also gone on in the standards essential patents world where uh, uh, competition law has actually resulted in a lot of more liberal licensing in the area of uh, standards essential things, particularly in the software area. And finally, in mergers, there's two issues I think need to be pursued. One, when two companies merge and they look at the, uh, you know, how concentrated the market is, we've, we've encouraged uh, the agencies to look at the cross-licensing agreements and, uh, and joint ventures between the companies to sort of modify the interpretation of how many, uh, uh, what the market shares look like because the, the companies are not completely independent of each other. I think that is a quite important thing. You see it in the oil pipeline business and some other areas too. And then cross light and then, and then the other thing is the pipeline products uh, have to be taken more seriously. You should, can, cannot allow a company to uh, take two products which are already in clinical trials and act as if they're not going to be direct competitors just because neither one has been registered yet. Thank you. I think every time I intervened in this panel, I spoke about the dual role of competition policy for innovation and access. So I'm not going to belabor that again. But I just want to say um, two brief points. One is that if you take historically how markets were created and, and capabilities were built in the pharmaceutical sector, say India, take other cases like Bangladesh and so on, who have actually functioning um, pharmaceutical production capacity today, focus really was on using competition as a tool to promote local innovation. And I think we somehow need to go back to thinking on, on, on those terms. The other thing I want to say is that I think it's really important to look at competition policy in a broader sense to promote innovation, especially now with, with all the trends where we are moving towards big data-driven personalized healthcare. We're looking at how data is going to continuously influence access to medicines. And I think in, in, in keeping in tune with that, we really have to get back to uh, looking at competition policy for innovation in addition to access. In a roundabout way of addressing uh, Anthony So's uh, question, uh, I would say that regional cooperation among authorities, in particular in terms of pricing on procurement authorities, an agreement regionally among procurement authorities that they're going to share pricing information and they either refuse to accept or refuse to enforce confidentiality agreements on purchases of product. And I would apply the same thing in the context of regulatory authorities, that regional regulatory authorities should agree that they're going to share information, whether it's clinical trial data or other, and that they should function cooperatively in making that type of uh, access available. Uh, and, and so that's kind of a general comment in this area of competition, that 
regional action is probably the one way to get some additional bargaining power uh, than the governments already have. Thank you, everybody. Uh, this has been uh, less of a dialogue of what we had initially envisioned, but uh, I hope uh, the dialogue will continue when we get out of this panel, and because there's a lot of um, knowledge in this room. From UNDP perspective, we want to work on competition law. We're working on competition law because we want to broaden the tools in the toolbox. We think all the tools are important. What we have learned in our initial work is that it's a tool that creates an opportunity for a bigger question beyond a specific product. It questions the system uh, and the systemic uh, consequences of the system, but it also allows to talk to stakeholders that traditionally have not involved in these conversations, go beyond ministers of health and maybe intellectual property offices and create dialogues that are maybe more multi-sectorial and uh, allows for countries to have discussions that are maybe an opportunity for more policy coherence at the national level across different uh, stakeholders, as well as for sharing of information and data um, and creating movements of solidarity, as Umanda um, was mentioning. So thank you for the opportunity to have an initial discussion on the potentials uh, for competition law, what we have learned, and much more that we need to learn and, and promote. Thank you.